Absolutely. Praise the Lord. That's a good word. We ain't supposed to tell somebody else so that they know they can make it through. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's absolutely right. That's what, uh, that's what Corinthians tells, I mean Thessalonians tells us. He said the reason the Lord brings us through these things is so that we can comfort others who go through the same thing that we go through with the same comfort we received from the Lord. So yeah, if the Lord's comforted your life, you have a testimony, you have a word to tell and, uh, and God will use it. I guarantee you, he's always at work around you, whether you see it or not, always at work around you. He pursues a continuing love relationship with you that is real and personal, not some cosmic in the sky something. We're talking about a love relationship with you that is real and personal. And then God invites you to join him in what he's doing. Not the other way around, by the way. You, you know, we do that a lot of times. We'll get up in the morning and we'll say, gimme, gimme, gimme in Jesus' name. Or God, here's my plan for the day. Will you bless me as I go? No, no, no. We find God's plan and we hear God's invitation and then God invites us. And when he invites us, that's his way of showing us. When he shows us, that's his way of inviting us into that relationship. Anyway, that's a whole nother message. We're, we're, in, we're on love and relationships now is what we're on. All the way through the next few weeks, uh, I know it's Thanksgiving. You know, next week is Thanksgiving. You guys ready for Thanksgiving? Everybody's got their families and all this, that, and you're, you're going, how many of you are going somewhere? You're going to go somewhere? Not many? Well, I mean, I know, the, what the, I know what they say, but I'm just asking for real, you know. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, for real, y'all aren't going for real. I'm just trying to see how many people are going to be at church next week so I'll know what, 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 I, what I want to do. Yeah, yeah, that Thanksgiving week. I tell you, Thanksgiving, Christmas, New Year's, all that little time right in there. Things usually get a little kind of iffy, you know, about, <laughs> about people. Either a lot of people come see you or you go see some people. And uh, church can either be real, real full or very few. So anyway, I guess this year, I guess 2020 has to be different, right? It couldn't be the same. It's got to be different. And it, it will be anyway. So anyway, we're, we're dealing with... Uh, we're dealing with, a, with, with the four laws of love. And I'm not, I'm not sure if you've ever even heard of the four laws of love before, but they're, they're there. Uh, God gave them to us, and they're, they're the laws, they're the keys to having great love relationships, like husbands and wives, marriages. I know most, most of you are either married or you are planning to marry. And I know some people say after a divorce sometimes, they say, I'm never getting married again. And then, the, you know, about six months later, uh, they'll, you'll be dating somebody and there you go. Because God didn't make you to be alone. We don't like to be alone. We, God's, that's the only thing God's looked at in his whole creation and said, that's not good. It's not good that man would be alone. All of the other animals have mates. All of, all of the other creation has, has place and, and has company and companionship with something that is just like them, except man. And he said, that's not a good thing for man to be alone. So I'm gonna rectify that. And he puts Adam to sleep and he, and he cuts Adam's side. He takes the rib out of Adam sews him back up or puts him back together, blows on it, it comes back together. And he takes that rib and he makes Eve. A wonderful, a new creation suited in every way to meet the needs of Adam. And a creation that Adam was suited in every way to meet her needs. So in other words, we were made for each other, male and female. We are made for each other. We're not the same, though. You, you're aware of this, right? Many people have trouble in life because they think we are the same, that we think alike, that the words we use mean the same thing, right? Well, yeah, we both speak English, but what you say and what she says could be two totally different things. Remember, women have satellite dishes, and they pick up all kinds of codes and men have rabbit ears with tinfoil, and they don't even get a code if there is one there, you know. Is that what you were saying? Yeah. This is one reason why women find it so hard to work together, by the way, just on the side. I, I don't mean to stir up anything. Now, I'm not trying to start a fight. 
I'm just telling you, if you've worked in an office or some kind of business with a bunch of women, you, ha you know what I'm talking about, and I don't even have to tell you, so we're just going to move on, all right? But anyway, the moment that God brought Eve to Adam and Adam received her, the moment he received her in chapter Genesis 2, verses, uh, starting at verse 20, God brings her in, and then, and then he gives her to the man, and, and Adam says some of the most <laughs> unromantic words I think ever spoken. <laughs> you know, um, uh, big moments d uh, deserve uh, memorable statements, right? Uh, like when we land on the moon, you know, <sighs> one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind, you know, that kind of statement. Um, Martin Luther King, when he saw, he saw the day when, when a man would be judged not by the color of his skin, but by the content of his heart. I mean, statements like that, memorable statements. Well, if we were expecting that kind of statement from Adam, we kind of got a, a little underwhelmed because Adam just looks at her and he says, this is now flesh of my flesh and bone of my bones. She shall be called woman because she came from man. And then he says two verses that are the four laws of love. I mean, these are the first things out of his mouth. Now, you know who put them there. God put the words there. These are not words that Adam is speaking for himself because they're going to contain uh, some information that don't, it doesn't even apply to Adam or Eve. He says, therefore... All right, she looks like me. She's got skin like me, except I like her skin better. She doesn't look like a rhinoceros, an elephant, an ostrich. I mean, she, she has skin like my skin, but I like hers better. Um, she has bones like my bones. Her bones don't look like an orangutan or a, or a gorilla or what. I mean, her bones look like my bones, except I like her bones better. And she has a womb. So any of you guys that think you can become a woman, let me just tell you, you can't do it. You can be a freak, uh, but you can't, you're not going to have a womb. That's what woman means, man with a womb. That's why he said that. <laughs> so anyway, he said, this is woman. You should be called woman because you were taken from man. You shall be called man with a womb because you were taken from man. So you're part of mankind. You're just the kind that has a womb. And then he says these magic words. Therefore, a man must leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife and they too shall become one flesh and they were both naked, the man and his wife and were not ashamed. Now there are the four laws of love right there. The first one we looked at is of course under, underlined up there, a man shall leave his father and mother. Your father and mother is your basic relationship. It is the greatest relationship that you have in life. Before you get married, it is the closest blood bond that you have. It is the strongest blood bond that you have is with your mother and father. They have been the leaders of your life, all of your life. God says, to, now remember, God said this to two people that don't have a mother or a father. You know, so you know it wasn't for them that God was saying this. God wasn't saying that. They, God was their father, obviously, but not in the traditional biological way. They certainly had no mother, so when God tells them to leave their father and mother, he's not saying it for them. He's saying, it, he's saying it to the generations that'll follow them. Here's the rule. The rule is that your marriage is the top priority of your life. God couldn't think of any greater relationship to say you got to get out of that relationship in order to tell us how important it is that the number one relationship that we have in life is our mate. And if you put them there, and of course, we, I shared a message about that, and you, if you put your mate number one, now don't just say they're number one. I mean, it, it, do, are you aware, do you know when you're a priority, I guess is what I'm trying to ask. I mean, it, if, if someone treats you as a priority, do you, are you aware of it? You, do you know that you're being treated as a priority? Uh, yeah, you do. You, yeah. you surely do. Yeah. And you know when you're not being treated as yeah. a priority. 
You know when somebody's just saying that and when, uh, well, if I'm a priority, then wh why, am I get, why am I always getting the last bit of energy you have in life? If I'm a priority, it means I get the best, not the worst. So God said your marriage is priority over everything except your relationship with Christ. That would be the only thing of higher priority, your personal relationship with Jesus Christ. But your marriage comes before your work, the, your school, your church. Now notice I didn't say Christ, I said your church. <laughs> They'll work you to death. They'll meet you to death. They'll do. Matter of fact, one, one year, Tanya and I looked at, uh, of course, passion all these years, I looked at a bulletin. We used to have bulletins, you know. And in the bulletin, it had all the announcements of what happened on every day of the week and then the order of service and all that. And I looked at that bulletin, and, I, and it just dawned in my mind, if somebody did all of that, they would never be at home. They, wouldn't, they would never be with their families. I said, what is this? We get, we're up here preaching about home and family and relationships, and we have an organization that is planning so many activities that if the, if the people in that organization did the activities, they would never be home and never be with their families. So God said, look, you gotta make it priority over everything. If it's not number one, it's not gonna work. Number two is the second underlined words up there and cleave to his wife. Cleave is, an, is not a word that we, that we use very often anymore. It's an old word. But it means to, it, it literally means to weld or to glue. But in the context of a relationship, it means to pursue with all your energy. So the second law of love is that I would pursue my mate with all of my energy. Yeah. That I would pursue my mate for the rest of our lives with all of the energy that I have. Which means that I am going to become a servant. It means that whatever my mate needs, it is my job to supply. Not, not, not Bubba down the street, and not, not Susie, you know, in the business. It's my job. That's my job. Yeah. And that I should pay attention and I should know and understand and learn my mate and everything about them so that I can supply everything that they need in life. That's what pursuing with all your energy is, is all about. It means that you, you have an effort involved in this. You don't, you don't lay on the couch and eat cornflakes and watch football games and she's outside needing something. You, you, you got to go, man. You, you got to know where, what, what, do, what do we need? What do you do? How, I mean, this is, this is the, the pursuit with all of our energy of our relationship. Now, sadly, what many people do, it was like, you know, I used the analogy of the store last week, that before you go in business, you, 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 you fix things up, you make it nice, you clean the windows, you put nice products in the window, you put an open for business sign on the door, you have a great attitude, you're friendly, you're, you're helpful, you're kind, until you get a loyal customer. And then when the customer becomes loyal, what you do is you get lazy, take them for granted, your attitude goes south, your friendliness goes south. In other words, everything you did to attract that customer now repels that customer because you have stopped pursuing. And so this is the second law of love, and if you do it, you have a 100% chance of having a happy marriage. You do number one, you do number two, boy, you halfway to, to a guaranteed successful marriage. Yeah. 
Now, I'm not saying that if you don't do them that you're going to get a divorce. You don't have to get a divorce. Nobody's going to make you get one. You might want one, though, <laughs> if you don't live by these laws of love. But you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna have a, 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 an unhappy life. You're going to have a life that doesn't, doesn't meet uh, the expectations of life. It, 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 it doesn't bless you. It hinders you. It doesn't grow you. It stunts you. It, it, it takes your personality away from you. It takes you out. So that's your choice. And it's really simple to do this. These four laws are very simple. And they are absolutely necessary. As a matter of fact, all marriage counseling could boil down to put that list on the door and say, all right, do that and you'll be happy. $200, let's go. <laughs> that's, how, that's how dynamic they are. All right, now, so last week I talked to you about why it's difficult to be a servant. I gave you four reasons for that. First one was selfishness. You know, you're just selfish. Can you roll through those? This is why we need to serve each other because we can't meet our own needs and we're sworn to fidelity. In other words, if your store doesn't have what I need, I can't shop at another store. At least not legally, right? I got to go outside my marriage, which is a no-no because I'm sworn to be with you and you alone. So that means get some stuff on your shelf. Don't let that shelf get bare because you're the only store I have. And I'm, I'm going to be demanding some product. Yes. <laughs> and you are too, so I'm not going to let my shelves get bare either. That's right, that's right. Because we are the only ones each other has. Because we are sworn to fidelity. Mm -hmm. So we either got to break our, break our oath, break our covenant, or you're going to be it, and I'm at your mercy, and you're at my mercy. And that's, that was the number one reason is selfishness because we don't really want to do that. Give, give us a second one. Pride and, and domination. Everybody, a lot of people want to dominate other people. You're not going to have any intimacy in a domination routine. You're not going, you're not, if, if somebody, if one of the people in this relationship is trying to dominate the relationship, you're not going to have closeness and intimacy because you can't share intimate things of your life with somebody who's go, who you know is going to use it against you one day. You can't tell them the desires of your heart, which is part of the intimacy of your life. I mean, see, y'all, I'm not just talking about sex. I'm talking about being intimate with each other, knowing who I am, what I am, what are my dreams? What are the desires of my life? What, makes, what, what buttons make me go forward? Which ones make me go back? I mean, you know me. That's intimacy. Intimacy means in to me see. Mm -hmm. I let you see into me. That is intimacy. And I'm not going to do it if you're trying to dominate me because I know that whatever I show you is going to be used against me one day. So that just throws that out the window. Give us the third one. I'm, I'm moving on. A worldly concept of success. People think, people think that you're successful if you can get others to serve you. That's kind of what we've been brought up to believe. We're at the top of the heap. We get the best. Everybody serves us. I mess you up in a marriage. That's totally opposite of that. Here's the fourth one, ignorance of God's nature. And that just means most people don't know that God's a giver and that he's a servant. God's a servant. Look at everything Jesus did when he was here on earth. He washed the disciples' feet. What about that? Yeah, yeah. That's not top of the heap. That's servant. He, uh, he fed them. He, 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 uh, on, on, when he, on his resurrection in John, in John uh, 21, he fed them a breakfast. He said, come over here and eat breakfast. And he actually served. I mean, God is, is a giver. And people don't understand God's nature, so they don't know that's their nature. And God created them to be that way. And so that's one of the reasons why it's really hard to serve each other. All right, let's go on now. Let's, let's, let's get to the laws of service, the servant rules, okay? All right, here are the servant rules. And we're going to use an acrostic, serve, S-E-R-V-E, and I know you can see that on your notes if you have them. And, uh, and I, I want to share with you these, these five rules now. These are, these are the, if you're going to be a servant and you're going to pursue your mate with all of your energy, 
These are the rules that you do it by. This is how you do it. All right, number one, serve what your spouse needs despite what you need, want, or understand. Now, I know you can read it, but I want to read it out loud again because I want you to get this. Serve what your spouse needs. And let me just assure you that you have what they need. Mm -hmm. How do I know? You're married. You, you wouldn't have come to each other. You wouldn't have grown to each other. You wouldn't have fallen in love with each other if you didn't have what each other needed. The fact that you fell in love, you made a commitment, you got married, you date, that is a testimony that you have what they need and they have what you need or you wouldn't have gotten married to start with. Mm -hmm. So serve what your spouse needs despite what you need mm -hmm. or what you want mm -hmm. or even what you understand. I don't understand why. Blah, blah, blah. Do it. This is not, you don't have to understand everything about it. I mean, I mean let, let's face it. If you, if, you, if you marry someone who is normal, they're, they're not going to be like you. Because we're different, right? Yeah. I mean, if I, if I marry and I have a normal marriage relationship, the person that I'm married to is going to be very much different from me. So I'm going to just give you, give you a, a couple of generalities here. And... I, I, a lot of times I hate to be re really dogmatic on lists of things because I can see your minds turning sometimes. And I can see when I say something dogmatic that you're, you're thinking of somebody you know that doesn't meet this. Well, I'm going to tell you, there probably are some people that won't meet what I'm about to tell you, but it's very few of them, very few of them. I'm going to give you the top four needs of men right now. Um, first one, first number one need of a man, and you're going to be surprised because it's not sex. The number, this is, uh, this is the mega need of men. This is the monster mega need of men, and it's for respect and honor. Men want to be respected. And by the way, parents, just so you'll know this, that goes for boys too. Boys want to be respected. Now, it doesn't mean you can't discipline them, but, but look, don't, don't, don't shame them and, and belittle them and, uh, and, 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 and be sarcastic with them and all that. You're hurting them. Yeah. They're just little men, you know? I mean, they, they have that same nature. They, they, don't, they don't want to be abused. They don't want to be mistreated and disrespected like, you know, it is a number, number one need of men is to be respected and to be honored. As a matter of fact, I'm going to tell you something about men. If you treat a man with honor, you will change the way he acts toward you. He can hate your guts. And you can start treating him with honor, and brother, he'll come around. That's how powerful this number one need is for men. And remember, I'm talking about needs. I'm not talking about wants. You got to have this. This is a need this is why we want a mate. One of the reasons why we want a mate is this is a need we have and we can't do it for ourselves. Number two, of course, is sex. Everybody knows that most men have greater sex drives than women do. Uh, by the way, the statistic, just for your interest's sake, is about 20% of women have a larger OB, uh, a libido than men. But listen, the point, that's not the point. The point is, he needs it. And, you, and, and it's your job to supply it. And it's the second most powerful need in his life. So whether you like it or not, whether you understand it or not, whether you, it, does, it I don't feel that way. I know you don't because you're not driven the same way. But he's going to have to do some stuff for you too that he's not going to like a whole lot either. All right, number three. I'm, I guess I'm implying that you wouldn't like it, but I guess you couldn't. Number three. Don't want to say too much. I'm sorry. Number three, recreational companionship. 
Recreational companionship means that he wants you to enjoy what he's involved in. He wants you to go with him. He wants you to, he wants you to participate. He wants you to know how to talk about it. And, and, and what you actually do there. I mean, now, you don't have to go out and get in a turkey stand with him, you know, I'm not saying that. I mean, if you wanted to, that'd probably be all right, but you're gonna have to, you know, dress down, stuff like that. But he shouldn't have a life that you don't know anything about. And when he starts talking about it, you don't even know how to relate to it. So sure, man, he, he has a complicated job. Well, man, you're going to be married the rest of your life. You, sooner or later, you ought to learn <laughs> about it, you know? I mean, repetition will just do that for you. And then when he talks about it, you can have some sympathy on him or some, you know, good job. That a way to go. Uh, sounds like they love you down there. You're doing a wonderful job. They're blessed to have you. I mean, all that kind of stuff. Men need that. That's a big need in their life. Look for a reason. Every day he comes home, here's what you ought to ask him. Uh, did somebody say something nice to you today? Or did somebody say something good to you today? You know what that does? It gives him a chance to brag on himself. It gives him the chance to say, yeah, you know what? I had a customer, and that customer said that I was the most helpful salesman in the whole place. And then you can say, well, I understand that. You're a great person. You're the most helpful person that I've ever been around. Everybody loves you for that. You know, I mean, that's, the, that's, that's re recreational companionship kind of stuff right there. It doesn't mean you have to get on the same softball team with them or stuff like that. It means know what they're doing. Here's number four, domestic support. Domestic support. By domestic support, that doesn't mean that husbands want the wives to do all of the work around the house. What domestic support, I mean, guys, look, we should do our part. I mean, we got some parts to do, and we need to do our part, and, and don't expect your wife to do all the work around the house. You do it. You get in there and do it. Help. Be a part of it. By domestic support, what I'm talking about is we, no matter how much we gripe about it, ladies, we like for you to be domestically centered. Now, by that, I mean, if it was left up to men Every bed in the house would have one pillow and one sheet, and that's all. I don't, e I, I don't know, ladies, I'm sorry I, I did, that I brought that up. I don't even know if you have the ability to even, um, uh, to, to even contemplate a thought like that. Uh, we have probably 12 pillows or something on our bed right now, <laughs> and it looks beautiful. <laughs> And we have to throw them all off when, we, when it gets have to get, to get in there and put them in the floor over there somewhere. But they got to be on that bed. But see what what I'm, what I'm talking about with this domestic with with this domestic support is it is amazing how much women can do to a house to make it a home. God has given women the, the what what it's called is is nesting, it, and I don't mean that to be an insulting word. It, it's just God has given you um, a, a, a nesting drive, and that nesting drive allows you to do miracles to these drab places that we would walk into. I don't even know if we'd have a picture on the wall if men did all of the nesting that was done around the thing. You could walk in anybody's house. You wouldn't even know who lived there. It had no personality. It had no attention to it. It had nothing about it except we all are alike. We don't care. And we gripe about that all the time, but that is really something that we really kind of like. We, even though we make fun of it, we, we really like that. So those, there's the top four needs of men. Now, if you're going to serve a man, no matter what, that's what you're going to do right there. Those four things right there, that's what they need. All right, let me give you, let's, let's, let's do a little turnabout's fair play. Let's give women's needs, all right? What are the four top needs of women? Number one, biggest need that a woman has is the need for security. A selfless, sacrificial husband who serves her and turns his heart toward her 
That's what makes her feel secure. To know, to have him do things without being asked, to have him uh, enthusiastically involved in uh, taking care of things and making sure everything's nice, not looking at other women, not talking about other people like that, but, but, but she knows that you're guy, you guys, that your heart is turned to her only. You, you don't turn your heart to other people. It's turned only to her. That makes her feel secure. And that is her number one need. Remember, this is a need. Just think about it this way. What is it that you need the most in your own life? I'm just talking personally. I, I, th these are statistical things. And they're, they're, they're close. But let's just say, say one, of the, you, one of these things that I mentioned, guys, is like, oh, man, you know, I need that. I got, I got to have that. I got to have yeah. Well, all right, now, what I'm telling you about these, this list right here for women, they feel the same way. It is a need. And it, it, it makes them happy or, or unhappy. Number two, oh, this is a big one. Number two is non-sexual affection. There is not a single cell in a man's brain that can understand that one. Non-sexual affection? It's like, I just want to be hugged. Why would I want to do that? <laughs> well, that's because that's what she needs. That's not what you need, I know, but that's what she needs. So get out of your brain and, and give some attention and some affection that's not trying to lead somewhere and all that kind of stuff. And, and they have to know that. You can't be sly about this. See, you think you sly. That's what the problem is. You, you, think, you think, okay, I'm going to just play along with this, and then I'm going to kind of move it where I want it to go. No, no. You might as well start over, because that, that's, that's not even in the ballpark of what she needs in her life at that moment. All right, number three, honest and open communication. Honest and open communication is just as important to her as sex is to you. Women, God has, God has created women to be stimulated through the ear gate. Men through the eye gate. That's why pornography is so damaging for men. Because it's taking advantage of, of vision, looking. God, God made men that way so they could be attracted they gave you makeup and everything else and all that so that we would be attracted. Ooh, nervous crowd. <laughs> all right. Uh, I, I'm just talking in generalities. All right. So, so that's what men... But guys, now I'm not saying that women don't like nice-looking men and well-groomed men and muscular and in shape and all. I mean... Everybody likes good, a, a good physical example of, of, the, of, of the other sex. We all appreciate that. But I'm telling you, women like to be talked to. And she is stimulated through what she hears. So the more you talk to her, the better it is and the more likely that she might be interested in other things. But if you sit there and crunch on your pig skins, talking about a football game, you know, and, 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 slot, and, and you, you, not, you don't say a word to her, you don't, you don't talk to her, you don't say anything, and then you're gonna expect when you get up from there and, and, and get ready to go to bed that there's gonna be some little something going on? <laughs> Are you crazy? That That... You you got you got to talk, guys. You got to talk. Look at me. Look at my wife, and just say, "Yep, he he knows how to talk." All right, number four. <laughs> number four, leadership. The fourth need is leadership. Now, I'm not talking about dominating. I'm talking about leading. Your wife needs for you to lead the home. You need to lead with the children. 
She shouldn't have to be the one that always punishes them and always catches them and always knows what's going on and, 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 and runs after them and finds them and whatever it is. You, you, she needs you to be the leader with the children. She needs you to be the spiritual leader of your home. Your wife should not be the most spiritual person in that house. It should be you. You should be the one that gets up on Sunday and says, all right, everybody, let's go. We're going to have a good day at church today. Get up, read your Bible with them. Have work. When you go to bed at night, you go in the bedroom and you kneel down with the kids and you pray at their bed. Let them hear their daddy praying. Get on your knees and pray with them. Your wife needs for you to lead in the home. And in the area of romance, she needs you to lead in that area also. Not like some kind of wild Brahma bull or something or another, but, but you, need to, you need to be sparky, you know? I mean, you need to be romantically thoughtful. You need, to, uh, you need to do nice things. You need to do romantic things. And, and, and you lead that. That's, that's what serving somebody, what they need means. Remember? You remember the point? The point is that Serve what your spouse needs despite what you need, what you want, or what you understand. We are different from each other. I, I do a little series called Not Wrong, Just Different. And that's just, that's the truth. There was a political person recently, obviously y'all, I'm not getting through with this, so just relax. I'm, I'm not gonna <laughs> carry on. Um, there was a political person that said, years ago, I can't, and I can't even remember who it was. But the comment I remember, because it is absolutely the truth, and the comment is, when someone tells you who they are, believe them. Think about that. When someone tells you who they are, believe them. Don't try to make them into something else. If they told you who they are, that's who they are. Don't be fooled by that. And, that, and now I'm going to go into marriage with this statement. When your wife or your, what did you say it? When your spouse. When your spouse tells you what they want, that's what they want. Don't, uh, don't shame them. Don't reject them. Don't misinterpret what they're saying and put it in words that you would mean if you said that. No, she said she wanted to be hugged. Hot dog, that means she's ready for some action. No, no. <laughs> she wants to be hugged. That's it. This, this, she's telling you what she wants, what she needs. And that's a dead giveaway as to what you need to do. I mean, let's look at it this way. All right, now, let's just put it in a whole other little uh, analogy here. Let's look at it this way. All right, let's say we go into a restaurant. And when we go to a restaurant, we sit down at the table. A waiter or a waitress comes over uh, and says, uh, uh, yes, sir, uh, what would you like to have today? And you say, uh, man, I want a hamburger and a whole of onions. I'll move my wife. Uh, I want French fries and I want a soda. And you notice that, that, that your wait staff is not writing down what you, what you just said. And, and, and you look back and, and the wait staff says, um, uh, that, I'm just not feeling that. I'm just not feeling that. Uh, that doesn't really sound good to me. And, and, and excuse me, I'm not trying to be ugly, but you know, I just have a hard time serving stuff that I don't think sounds good to me. So why don't you try again? So you say, well, all right, all right, well, pizza, I want pizza. Well, you know, pizza's a pretty heavy food. And it, if you don't mind me saying, you look like maybe you've had a few of them lately and, uh, and, and you probably don't need to be eating pizza today. I know, we'll serve you salad. Now that right there is what happens in marriage many, many, many times. You place your order and they change it because that's not what sounds good to them. Who's eating this? Me or them? I mean, I'm telling you, I'm placing my order. You are 
my mate. You said you love me enough to serve me and meet my needs, and I serve you and meet your needs. And I'm telling you, I want a hamburger, and you keep changing it because evidently you think I'm like you. And, it, and, and evidently, uh, you're normal, and I'm not normal, and you're trying to make me like you. No, a man and a woman are different creations by God. Women are not just long-haired men. We have a totally different mindset. And the only way marriage works is not to serve them what you need, but to serve them what they need in life. It doesn't matter. What, I don't care whether you want to talk or not. Talk. I don't care how you feel about, uh, about whatever it is the request is. Do it. This is not about you. This is about what they need. This is a sacrificial relationship. You know what? A, a covenant is a sacrificial relationship. A contract is not. And sadly, many marriages act like contracts and not covenants. A covenant means I'm going to sacrifice for you and you're going to sacrifice for me. And a marriage is a sacrificial relationship. And, 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 and your job is to meet the needs of your spouse. Oh, by the way, just let me point out one thing that you might have forgotten. When you were dating, oh, you did hundreds of things you didn't like to do. And you were happy to do it. But now you're taking your customer for granted. Getting lazy about it. All right. Do you want to get one more? No, no, I don't. All right, let me get one more. And we get to E and then we're going home, okay? It's kind of short. All right, E. Enjoy serving your spouse and do it with a joyful attitude. All right, get that now. Enjoy serving your spouse and do it with a joyful attitude. When you serve your spouse with a joyful attitude, it communicates love, value, and priority. When you are happy to serve, it says to your mate, I, I love you, uh, I cherish you, you are precious to me, and whatever you need, you are the priority of my life. Love, value, and priority. I love to serve Tanya. I love to. I love to make her happy. I love for her to be happy. I want her to be happy. If I can just think something to make her happy, I'm doing it because I want her to be happy that she married me and happy in life. The number one reason I am on this earth is to serve Jesus. The number two reason that I am on this earth is to serve Tanya. She's not a ball and chain. She's not a distraction. She, 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 she's, not a, she's not a problem that I have to deal with. That's my mate. That's the one that loves me in spite of myself and the one that would sacrifice everything for me. So why wouldn't I joyfully serve that, serve her? When I grudgingly serve my spouse, it communicates rejection, low value, and low priority. And you do this through shaming, eye-rolling, poor attitude, bad body language, half-hearted effort, ne negative comment, comparisons, criticizing, sarcasm, and the like. Now, we should never sin in order to serve our spouse. But short of sin... You can get in on everything else. Let me give you one of my little pet peeves and then, and then we're going to say amen. This is just a little pet peeve of mine in the, in the area of serving. Have you ever been, have you ever been to a restaurant and, um, and, 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 so, and the waitress or waiter comes, serving staff comes to your table and, um, 
and you, you, you drop your fork on the floor, let's just say, and the, and the, and the staff reaches down and, and picks it up and puts it, you know, gives you some, a new set, and then you say, thank you. And then they say, no problem. That just doesn't sit well with me, that no problem. I mean, I, I, know, I know you look at me going, you know, you're just trying to start something. No, I, I'm, I mean, that, it shouldn't be a problem. That's your job. If I didn't drop my silverware on the floor, you wouldn't have a job. I'm paying you to do this job. So, sure it's no problem. It shouldn't be a problem. Now, I know what everybody means when they say no problem. So don't think I'm some kind of ogre. I know what people mean. I know it's just a response to thank you and, it's, and, and they're trying to be nice too and all that. But here's a word I like much better. And I think it's a word that reflects this enthusiasm about serving your mate. It is my privilege. Thank you, my privilege. Isn't that a much better word? Isn't that a mu much better attitude about the thing? No, no problem. My pleasure. That's what, it, that's what serving our mate is in, in, in marriage. You see why I'm, I'm telling you if you do these things, you'll have a 100% chance of success? Because it's just the truth. This is what God designed us to be. I'm sorry I'm going so slow, but I guess I got a lot to say about it. <laughs> all right, so, all right, all right, it's time to quit. Yeah.